Good morning, Grade 7, and welcome to Worksheet Cloud, Grade 7 Natural Sciences. My name is Mrs. Hall, and I'm going to be taking you through a journey of the Grade 7 Natural Science curriculum during the next few weeks of lockdown. If you have a question during the lesson, please send me an email with your question to grade 7 at worksheetcloud.com. I'm so looking forward to spending this time with you and helping you to keep on track with your studies. Just remember, a vaccination needs to be developed for the COVID-19 virus. And who do you think will do this? A scientist. And if you love science as much as I do, maybe one day you could very well be one of those scientists helping to develop a cure to the COVID-19 virus right now, today. Who knows, you might even prevent a future lockdown for your own children one day. Think how much they would thank you. I'm pretty sure you guys are ready to get out there and back onto the sports field and to be with your friends. I know how tough this could be. Right, the rules for my online classroom, Grade 7. Popcorn is mandatory. And PJs are welcome. Well, I'm not going to see them anyway, so sit back. And like I like to tell my grade 7s, relax and enjoy. Let's get started. Today's lesson is on sexual reproduction in angiosperms. We are going to be speaking about the structure of a flower, unisexual and bisexual flowers, and pollination and pollinators. Let's start with the four whorls of a flower. As you know, flowers are made up of different parts. The parts are arranged in circles that fit into each other, and these circles are known as whorls. If you follow here with the key and on the screen, you will see the outermost whorl is called the sepals. The sepals are used for protection and to protect the bud of the flower in its developing stage. The second whorl is known as the petals. The petals are the pretty colored part of the flower. They can be fused, which means joined together, or separate, like in this flower. Birds and insects are known as pollinators, and they are attracted to this whorl to collect the nectar. The third whorl Whorl is made up of the stamen, which is the male part of the flower, and the fourth whorl is called the carpel or the pistil, as some textbooks refer to it as. Let's take a deeper look at the stamen. The stamen, as I told you earlier, is the male part of the flower. It consists of the anther, which has the pollen grains. These are known as the male sex cells. It also consists of the filament, and the job of the filament is to hold the anther up in the flower. The fourth whorl is the carpal. This is the female part of the flower and consists of the stigma, which is sticky at the top. This is so that the pollen can stick to it. The style, which attaches the stigma to the ovary, and obviously the ovary. The ovary at the bottom contains the ovules. The ovules are the immature seeds, and each ovule contains a female sex cell. And I will be discussing with you tomorrow how fertilization takes place inside the ovary. Let's take a look at the different types of flowers that we have. We have bisexual flowers and we have unisexual flowers. Now unisexual flowers, if you look at the prefix for unisexual, it says uni means singular. Okay, so unisexual flowers only have one part, either the male part 
or the female part. And here we have an example of a unisexual flower. Over here we have a bisexual flower. And if you look again at the prefix for the word bisexual, bi means two. So this flower has both the male and the female parts. Let's take a look at a cucumber plant. Look at the bright yellow flowers growing on it. Look behind each flower and you will notice that behind this one is a small immature cucumber. Female flowers on the cucumber plants have an immature bloom known as the ovary growing behind it, while the male flowers do not have that immature bloom. Male flowers grow on thinner looking stems. These are called unisexual flowers. Unisexual flowers are known as imperfect flowers. I bet the next time you're out in the garden, you will be looking at flowers in a very different way, checking out which are the unisexual ones and which are the bisexual ones, and actually going a little bit closer and examining just how wonderful nature really is. I actually hope you have a new appreciation for flowers now that you've delved a little bit deeper into them and how wonderful they are and the miracle of new seeds growing and new flowers developing in your garden. You can see over here quite clearly both the male and female parts. There you can see the sticky stigma and here you have the stamen which is made up of the anther and the filament. This would be a bisexual flower. And over here we have a sunflower and if you look closely you can also see the pistils or carpels as well as the stamens and it's currently being pollinated by a very friendly bee. Now let's take a look at pollination and pollinators. How do all these beautiful flowers get pollinated? As you know, new plants grow from seeds. Seeds can only form in the flower if the flower has been pollinated and fertilization has taken place. Pollination is the transfer of pollen from the male part of the flower, the stamen, to the female part of the flower, the pistil or carpel. Pollinators, those are your bees and your butterflies, are the organisms that carry pollen from one flower to another. Let's take a look at how flowers are adapted to be pollinated. First of all, wind pollinated flowers. These flowers are positioned at the tips of very long stems, as you can see in the diagram. They do not have bright petals, nectar or scent. The pollen grains are small and light, so they can be carried easily by the wind. Here you can see them. They have long stigmas and filaments which are exposed to the wind and the stigmas are branched a little bit like feathers to increase the surface area that is exposed to the wind. So again, when you're out in the garden, take a look at the type of flower and how it's positioned and decide for yourself what kind of pollination takes place for this specific flower in your garden. Now, let's take a look at bird pollinated flowers. Bird pollinated flowers have brightly colored petals, typically red, yellow, and orange. They have no scent as birds have a very weak sense of smell. They produce large quantities of nectar because obviously the birds come there for food as well. They're not just coming to pollinate the flower. They have tubular or trumpet shaped petals so that the pollen sticks to the bird's beak. They have long stamens and stigmas to make contact with the beak as you can clearly over here and the beak is able to fit into the tubular or trumpet shaped petals. 
insect pollinated flowers. Insect pollinated flowers have a sweet smell, obviously because they want to attract the insects. They are brightly colored, typically blue, red, white and purple flowers. They produce nectar again for the insects, as well as having sticky pollen that sticks to the insect's body. The stamen and the stigma are inside the flower. The pollen on the insect body, insect's body rubs off onto the stigma while the insect is crawling around on the flower. And again, look very carefully at how wonder, wonderful it is about the structure of the flower and how it's set up specifically for the pollination of insects or for the insects to pollinate it, sorry. Grade sevens, I really hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Tomorrow, we take an in-depth look at the fertilization of angiosperms. Enjoy the rest of your day. Be kind to your siblings. I know it's hard, but try. It's not easy being cooped up together. Help your mom and dad with the chores around the house, and I will see you tomorrow. Same time, same place. But I'm really hoping that you're not going to be in the same pajamas. Have a good day, grade sevens. See you tomorrow.